set in the heart of North America is on Earth. Into them, from countless lakes caught in the rocky pockets of the Canadian Shield, thousands of streams thread their way. Southward, through silent wilderness, they fall into the five great lakes, into a hundred thousand square miles of fresh water. The Great Lakes, boundary and bond between the United States and Canada. Around the wooded shores, cities and shipping have grown. For American pioneers pushing weapons, the lakes were highways to settlement. The heavy industry of two nations grew up in lake cities, for iron and coal could travel easily by water from the new western lands to the eastern mills and foundries. Far inland, there has grown a maritime empire of 40 millions, ranged round the broad expanse of the Great Lakes. A thousand ships ply these inland oceans through eight months of navigation. Venice and the Riviera lie in the same latitude, but the lakes are locked in ice for four months of winter. The lake boats know no boundaries. Their paths cross and recross between countries. In their huge holes, they carry the bread and iron of North America. They are built to take a maximum of bulk cargo down the lakes and through the canals. The biggest of them can stow 15,000 tons into her hollow hull. The blunt bows of a freighter nose into port. Into her holds, longshoremen will load flour and foodstuffs and mixed freight of all kinds. Ships bring the yield of the soil and the rocks, grain and ore, eastward across the lakes. The products of factories and mills go west from the industrial cities of Erie and Ontario towards Lake Superior and the prairie towns. Building ships to carry the freight are the welders and riveters in lake shipyards, where for two centuries wooden schooners and iron steamers have taken shape along the shore. Today at Midland and Collingwood, Kingston and Port Arthur, the welders are at work on new ships, huge bulk freighters for grain, or small canalers to travel down the locks and canals of the St. Lawrence River Channel. The largest freshwater sea in the world is Lake Superior, the size of Ireland. Along its north shore lies the ancient Canadian shield, covered with timber and sown with rich metallic ores. Grain elevators at Lake Head mark the entrance to the prairies, the western terminus of shipping on the Canadian lakes. Into Superior every spring, Millions of feet of pulp logs are swept down from the streams of northern Ontario. From coves along the north shore, log booms are towed to the mills. There, sure-footed drivers with their peavies pull the logs into place for the long climb up the jack ladders. Tumbling off the ladders into swift moving water, the logs are floated along the flumes towards the distant towers of the pulp mill. At the mill, they climb upward again, piling up onto an immense and shifting pyramid of logs, millions of feet of timber stacked against the sky, wood for pulp and plastics, paper and cloth. Right to the pulp mills, Big lake boats bring the chemicals for paper making. From all over the Americas, raw materials can iron ships to mid-continent. Raw sulfur came from Texas, beating along the Atlantic seaboard to Montreal. There it transferred into a lake's freighter 
And now the big iron grab scoops it from the holes and feeds it to the mills to bleach the pulp for paper. Drums of finished newsprint will cross the continent, bound for thundering presses of great daily newspapers in Chicago, St. Louis, Toronto, and New York. Half the newsprint used in the United States comes down from northern Canada. Down from the endless spruce forest came the timber. Now in its new form, it is piled along the docks ready to go out from Canada to the whole world. 300 miles west of Superior is Winnipeg. From here, the early harvest of the Canadian prairie moves by rail to Lakehead, thence by boat across the cold reaches of Lake Superior on the first leg of its journey east. Each year on the sunny grain fields, Canadian farmers harvest millions of bushels of wheat, oats, and barley. Each year, from the red-painted elevators, the long freights loaded with grain move off across the prairies. They head for western Ontario, down the Caministiquia Valley to the tall line of terminal elevators ranged along the shore at Port Arthur and Fort William. In the shadow of towering elevators, loaded cars are locked and tipped up on end, pouring their grain into great bins. Elevators at the lake head can store nearly a hundred million bushels of grain. Here in a rising flood are poured the harvest from Rosetown and Dauphin, Kansak and Minnedosa. The empty car is righted, unlocked and shunted off again into the sunshine taking its place in strings of empty freights that have left their grain in the great clean cylindrical towers along the shore. Alongside into the hollow hulls of waiting grain boats, wheat pours in a rushing torrent. From Port Arthur and Fort William, the boats will carry it eastward to the lower lakes and Montreal. Government inspectors are on the job, sampling the grain as it thunders into the holds. In seven hours, a big freighter is filled with half a million bushels of grain under hatches. Ready to sail. Ready for clear weather or sudden storm. Freshwater sailors on these inland seas are hardy, for they must deal with fogs and snow and gales that drive the waters of a lake and pile them six feet higher at one end than another. Farewell to the Twin Cities. The first leg down the lakes lies ahead, 300 miles of open water eastward to Sault Ste. Marie. Down Thunder Bay, past Pie Island and the Sleeping Giant, the lake boat heads to sea. Fog, the throb of unseen shipping, the hollow blast of steamer sirens in the mist demands untiring lookout. Superior's waters are deepest and coldest of all the lakes, and with the warmth of summer air, curtains of fog come down around the ships. The lake's history for 200 years is marked with wreck and storm. This is an uncertain ocean, frozen in winter,
swept by the wind and weather currents of a continental plain, not those of the salt sea. Through the eight-month shipping season, freighters carrying ore and grain from the western end of the lakes, from Duluth and Port Arthur, file into Sault Ste. Marie. They take their place in a steady parade through Canadian and American locks to Lake Huron and the lower lakes. Every 20 minutes, a ship enters the locks and drops down into St. Mary's River. Engineers at the Sioux direct a flow of shipping greater than that through Panama and the Suez combined. The gates swing outward. The lake boat steams ahead. She is built to fit the locks as snugly as may be, with bluff bows and engines aft, to carry through all the cargo she can load and still have clearance. Her keel is close to the floor of the locks. Her sides may scrape their concrete walls. The big hulls slide by, patiently threading through locks and channels. They carry the fruits of the soil and the factories. They bind the economy of east and west, of city and farm, Canadian and American, moving in an endless stream. The iron ore from west of Superior and limestone from Lake Michigan are raw materials for steel. They come in big carriers to Canadian steel mills at Sault Ste. Marie. Here, as in all the lake cities, freighters can bring ore and coal right to the mills. At the flaming hearths and furnaces of the Sioux of Welland, Hamilton and Toronto, workers forge the heavy industry of Canada. Iron and steel for tractors and ships, machines and railways. On both sides of the lakes, smoking mills are fabricating steel for two nations. From the Sioux out into Lake Huron, the flow of shipping moves south and east, past Georgian Bay, into the crowded St. Clair River, and on to Lake Erie. Down the intricate channels of Lower St. Mary's River, lake's captains take their ships out into open water. Some head west again for Chicago and Lake Michigan ports, but most beat across the blue waters of Lake Huron towards the lower lakes. At the height of the season, the freighters ride in line astern. Horizons are never clear of smoke from passing ships. The lake's captain, his own pilot in open water and in harbor as well, brings his ship in steady procession under the Blue Water Bridge into the oil port of Sarnia. Past the tanks and refineries of Sarnia, a great oil depot for eastern Canadian industry, the loaded tankers slip down the St. Clair River. Ore carriers from the upper lakes drop past the great mills and foundries on the American shore, past River Rouge and the sprawling automobile plants of Michigan, largest in the world. Government steamers, yachts, and tugboats stream down the muddy current, passing the heavy carriers along the waterfront of Windsor, where great Canadian factories line the river shore. At Detroit, the harbor throbs with the joint industry and commerce of two neighbor nations. Here is a four-way intersection where shipping crosses east and west along the lakes and railway traffic spans the river north and south. 
There is the United States. Here is Canada. So close the cities, Detroit and Windsor, linked by bridge and tunnel and the everyday movement of their people. Downstream, the freighters file beneath Ambassador Bridge. Into Lake Erie now, eastward they go 200 miles to the Long Canal at Welland, skirting Niagara River and the famous falls. They hold a steady seven knots down Lake Erie, tracing a white wake along well-traveled shipping lanes. At Port Colburn, they enter the Welland Canal, a 25-mile channel cut by Canadian engineers past the rapids and cataracts of Niagara into Lake Ontario. Pent-up waters of four inland seas foaming down Niagara River and the thundering falls drop 300 feet into the last and smallest of the lakes. But through the towering locks of Welland Canal, bigger than any at Panama, the ships pass down from Erie to Ontario in seven easy stages. They follow the straight channel through historic Ontario farmlands, through the steel and chemical plants of busy Welland Town, where 12 million tons of shipping passes each season. Grain from the prairies, automobiles from Windsor, crushed rock and fuel oil head down the canal towards eastern Canada and the long channel of the St. Lawrence River to the Atlantic. From the Lake Ontario side, ships approach the massive twin flight locks at Thorold, which will lift them 140 feet towards the upper levels of the canal. The lock gates swing shut behind a canaller headed for the upper lakes. Soon she will be high over the hill, threading through the farmlands. Meantime, at the lower end of the canal, freighters clear the last locks and steam out onto open water in Lake Ontario. lake-built city in Canada is Toronto, third greatest port in the Dominion. Crowded freight yards and factories mark the capital of Ontario, the heart of industrial Canada. In the growth of the farmlands around her, in the movement of settlers up the lakes to the west, Toronto became a great port. Ontario grew with the growing west, shipping her manufacturers and machines up the lakes to the new lands and receiving their grain and raw stuffs in return. Here along the crowded docks is the sign of Canada's growing greatness in industry. Behind the clattering winches and the ceaseless movement of freight, is the strength of Canadian machines, the wealth of the Canadian lands and harvests. Here is the Canada that became fifth world trader, rich in metals, grain, and timber. A vigorous nation, quick to exploit her riches, to surge ahead in world commerce, and take her place among the industrial peoples of the future. Her holds emptied, the freighter promptly takes on new cargo, saving precious time for another trip up the lakes before winter comes and freezes shipping to a standstill. The output of Canadian factories pours into the hold to go back up the lakes, or perhaps to go eastward again, to Kingston and the Thousand Islands, down the St. Lawrence to the sea. For the St. Lawrence links the five lakes with the Atlantic and ocean-going freighters will steam all the way down the future seaway into mid-continent. Around these great lakes, 
the United States and Canada have built the mightiest industrial empire on Earth. The richness of grain fields and forests and new land has built it. The hardihood of settlers and the skill of engineers. Into the lake boats, dockers load the wealth of a whole continent. Eight months every year, the long ships head out across a broad seaway between friendly nations to carry all the crops and cargoes they can before the season ends. Soon the cold winds will come, the ice and the white silence of winter. But with the first open water, the ships will leave harbor, and a swift rush of life will surge again across the great lakes of North America. <laughs>